everybody today? Great. Well, let's look to the Lord in prayer as we open our service up. Father, we just thank you and praise you once again, Lord, for the privilege that we have to be able to come and to meet here in this place. And Father, we just ask that you would um, meet with us today and open our hearts to what you have for us, Lord, through your word. I pray that in everything that we say and do, that it would honor you and glorify you and raise you up. And Lord, we know your word tells us that if you be lifted up, that you will draw all men to yourself. And so, Father, we pray that you would do that today. Draw us ever closer to yourself. And God, will be careful to thank you and praise you for all this we ask in Christ's most precious and holy name. And all God's people said, amen. So glad that you've joined us today. Can you believe that it's almost the middle of July? Where has the summer gone? I mean, and it hasn't rained. Like, when was the last time it rained? when Noah was on the ark, right? It seems like, oh man, it's been a great hot summer, but uh, so glad that you joined us today. Let me just share with you a few announcements. Pastor Steve and Darla are away. They went to camp and then to recuperate from camp, they took a little mini vacation. So uh, be praying for them as they're uh, traveling and we'll be back later this week. But um, Camp Good News happened this past week and I heard that there was uh, two or three, maybe four kids that accepted the Lord as their own personal savior. So that's an awesome thing, so yeah. Praise God for that. Thank you 
Those of you that were praying for the kids away at camp and all the adults and the young people that were there helping, appreciate those prayers and things went well. We didn't lose anybody, which is awesome. And um, so, because I wasn't there to lose them. That's what it was. So anyway, but there is uh, some items that were lost. Uh, we have a lost and found table uh, just out in the foyer. So um, some stuff that kids uh, took to camp but didn't bring home from camp. So we brought them home. They've all been cleaned um, from the stuff at camp and uh, put out on a table in there. So parents, if you would walk by and look and say, oh yeah, I recognize those tennis shoes or that particular shirt or those pair of pants or that towel, um, just take it and uh, claim it. That would be awesome. I, I did notice there's not as much lost and found as we've had in previous years, so which is a good thing. Either kids aren't taking as much stuff to camp or they're bringing most of their stuff home. That's awesome. Uh, tonight, 6 o'clock here at the, the church in the auditorium, we'll have prayer and praise. Every month we get together once a month in the evening, on Sunday evening, to have prayer time. And since the 4th was last uh, week, um, the first of uh, the month, we moved it to this week. So tonight at 6 o'clock, prayer and praise time here at the church. And then coming up July 24th, you've probably heard that there's a Christian concert coming to town featuring Peter Furler and Phil Joel. Uh, former newsboys will be singing in concerts completely free. It's being uh, sponsored by the Jonathan Group and the World Ministerial, so we're offering it completely free uh, concert that evening, so we encourage you to come out at 6 o'clock at Allison Park and to invite people. It's not just for Christians. We want people that are uh, come out to the concert that are maybe lost outside of a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ that might come and have an opportunity to hear the gospel presented and accept him as their Lord and Savior. So uh, that concert is happening July 24th, but um, there's an opportunity to be involved in praying for that as well. There's a, kind of an informal seven-day prayer walk that's being uh, kind of organized to walk around Allison Park. There's a a walk past sidewalk that goes all the way around the park. And so um, we're starting next Saturday for seven days doing a prayer walk uh, each day. Pick a time to go there and to walk a lap around the park praying. Uh, and then on the Saturday of the concert at 9 a.m., get together and walk seven times around the park praying those seven laps. It'll give you some exercise, but it also uh, fortify that whole area with the Spirit of God and prayer for what's going to be happening that evening at 6 o'clock. Uh, kind of like um, Joshua and the children of Israel as they marched around Jericho. We don't want the pavilion to fall down, but to uphold what happens there that evening with prayer. And so if you'd like to be involved in that or if you can any day during uh, next week starting Saturday through the previous or the following Saturday, July 24th, to walk there. The information's in your bulletin about that. But um, then also, because of the concert, we're bringing it here, and um, we need help. We need volunteers to help with the concert. We've had a lot of people, or some people, volunteer for help, but we've got uh, help needed, people to organize uh, different things, just some areas of help that we need. We need several people to help with merchandise sales, uh, tables that are set up to sell t-shirts and things like that. We need uh, security people, people that will just walk around with these really cool shirts that say security on the back and um, pass out water and just, you know, maybe not to be there for the concert's sake, but to be there to help uh, others, uh, to let people know, hey, I'm security. Because when you have security, we're probably going to have a lot of people from out of town come to this concert too. And just seeing people that are wearing security shirts help them to recognize, hey, they probably are in charge and know what's happening. So you can... Um, take care of their needs, whatever they may be, answer questions that they have and give them a bottle of water or whatever. But we also, so we need security people. We also need four or five people to help with unloading sound equipment uh, that afternoon at two o'clock and then reloading it back up after the concert. So some people, able body individuals that can move sound stuff, whatever. So if you'd like to help out in any of those areas or maybe other areas that I haven't mentioned, uh, if you just see myself, let me know that you're interested in helping out. Or Steve Fisher, um, there's ways and opportunities for you to volunteer to help with that. So uh, that's all the announcements I have. I'll turn this back over to our praise and worship team. Thank you, Wayne. Um, just a, a, a footnote here about Peter further. Um, we were, the song we sang at the very beginning was a song that uh, Newsboys did that Peter 
further wrote. And, and as a matter of fact, several of the songs that we're singing this morning um, were written by him. And, and as uh, I was visiting with Nancy beforehand, she said, oh, yeah, and this song was written by him, and this song was written by him, and this song. I'm like, oh, I had no idea how prolific he was in, in his writing. So I uh, just encourage you to, as we sing songs this morning, you're going to go, really? That's Peter? So that's just another incentive maybe to go to the concert and enjoy the songs we sing. Now, I do have a verse that I want to share here, and it, and it fits into the overall theme of our service this morning, which is actually Jesus. <laughs> and uh, it says here, Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is a Lord to the glory of God the Father. And as we worship this morning, I want you to remember it is all about Jesus. Let's stand and sing. As we lift up our
may be seated. opportunity to participate together in what we refer to as the Lord's Communion, and uh, hopefully you picked up some elements on your way in today. Paul, writing about this to the believers in Corinth, said this in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. He says, For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the same Lord Jesus, on the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. So we do this as a remembrance, a memorial to remind ourselves just what it was that Jesus Christ did for each and every one of us by allowing himself to be placed on a cross and die for our sins. And so as often as we partake of these elements in this type of a ceremony, we remember the Lord's death. And in preparation of that, I wanted us to just uh, listen to how Isaiah the prophet described the pain and agony that Jesus went through on the cross hundreds of years before it ever happened. He writes in Isaiah chapter 53, beginning in verse 3, he says, He, speaking of the Lord Jesus Christ, is despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, and we hid, as it were, our faces from him. 
He was despised and we did not esteem him. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He was led as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before its shears is silent, so he opened not his mouth. He was taken from prison and from judgment, and who will declare his generation? For he was cut off from the land of the living. For the transgressions of my people he was stricken. And they made his grave with the wicked, but with the rich at his death, because he had done no violence, nor was there any deceit in his mouth. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He has put him to grief. When you make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed, he shall prolong his days and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He shall see the labor of his soul and be satisfied by his knowledge. My righteous servants shall justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out his soul unto death. And he was numbered with the transgressors. And he bore the sin of many and made transgression for the transgressors. That's the words of Isaiah the prophet prophesying about what Jesus was to do on the cross for us. For each and every one of us that name the name of Christ, that have trusted in him as our own personal savior, he paid our penalty by his death, by his suffering, by his affliction. And that's what we remember today as we partake of these elements. Two elements, the bread, which represents the body of Christ, and the juice, which represents the blood that was shed for us. So we'll talk specifically about each of these elements and then partake of them together. First, Jesus instituted this with his disciples in Matthew. Matthew writes and says, And as they were eating, Jesus took bread blessed and broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, take, eat, this is my body. Let's ask the Lord's blessing on this element. Father, we thank you and praise you for the privilege that we have today to remember what it was that you did for us by allowing your son to be sacrificed for our sin, to hang there on that cross, to give up his life, for us. And Lord, as we partake of this bread that represents the body of Christ, the perfect, sinless sacrifice for us, I pray we do it with a spirit of remembrance and gratitude. In Jesus' name, amen. Matthew goes on in verse 27 and says, Then he took the cup. And he gave thanks and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you, for this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. But I say to you, I will not drink of the fruit of this vine from now on until the day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. Let's ask the Lord's blessing on the Jews. Father, as we pause once again, we come to you with thankful and grateful hearts for the shed blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Lord, we know that your word tells us without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sins. And so, Father, thank you for allowing Jesus Christ to shed his own precious blood that makes a way for me and every one of us to have eternal life through you. So, Father, thank you for your blood. And we ask this in Christ's name. Amen. And just place those cups in the little holders there in front of you in the chairs, and I'll invite the praise team back to continue our worship.
three seconds it takes. Psalm 20, verse 5 says, May we shout for joy over your victory and lift our banners in the name of our God. Let us lift up our voices this morning and praise our Lord and King. Let's stand and sing.
dismissed at Children's Church. thanks to you for everything that you've done. You are victorious, and you have shared that with us. Thank you so much, dear God. Amen.
I am so loud. <laughs> I'm so happy to be able to be up here and preach today. I realize that it's been a month since I've been behind the pulpit, um, up here anyway. Uh, they gave me like five to eight minutes last Sunday, and I took advantage and took more than that. But um, so um, I hopefully, I'm not giving you four weeks worth of messages in one day. Uh, today, but uh, I'm excited about being able to preach from God's Word once again. This week, though, while I was doing some research uh, for my sermon, uh, I came across a website that promoted an article that caught my attention. It was uh, entitled, The Top 10 Thankless Jobs in the U.S. And the tagline to the article read as follows, do you consider yourself to be part of that faceless workforce that never gets a thank you? Maybe you're like, yeah, that's exactly how I feel. It goes on and says, common sense demands that we categorize all those who are underpaid, overworked, disrespected, unnoticed, and fall in that thankless job category. And when you look at the list, I'm going to go through the list with you rather quickly of the top 10 thankless jobs in the U.S., you would have to, I think, concede that yes, these are thankless jobs. Um, I mean, just consider as, we, as I list them off for you, when was the last time that you took the time to actually express gratitudes for somebody in one of these professions? Think about this. Number 10 on the list was police, fire, and ambulance, not workers, dispatchers. Police, fire, and ambulance dispatchers. It's not like you call 911 and say, thank you for picking up. I appreciate your being there so I can share with you my emergency. We just never really think about those people. They're just there. They do their job. And uh, it's thankless job. Number nine, interns. I, I don't know why they made that list, but you think about it. Interns really don't get the credit that they possibly deserve. Paralegals was number eight. Window cleaners, number seven. When was the last time you thanked a window cleaner? Maybe it's somebody in your own home that you need to, to thank. Number six, garbage collectors. I mean, do you ever like give a birthday card to your garbage man? You know, thank him for doing what he, you know. What would happen if they didn't, you know, they just stopped collecting garbage? Number five, IRS agents. <laughs> Thankfully, I've not had to deal with an IRS agent. Um, that's the only thanks I give. Um, number four, military. Number three, social workers. And number one, farmers. Now, you're probably, how many of you are farmers or have been a farmer? Yeah. Thankless job. We love the produce and the food and all that comes as a result of farmers, but we don't really just, you know, pull up to somebody in the combine and say, hey, thanks a lot for what you do. Appreciate you. Just don't happen. Thankless job. But you probably noticed that I skipped to number two because wedged between number three, social workers, and number one, farmers, is this category called teachers. Teachers. Thankless job. Unlike farmers, you know your teachers. And um, how many of you, though, have personally thanked your teachers on your graduation day? You know, whether or not you like them or not, and whether or not they had a huge role or a small role in your life, teachers are instrumental in getting you to where you are right now in your life. They played a, a role, sometimes a huge role. For the amount of work that teachers do, teachers would argue that they don't get paid enough. To do it. And high school and middle school teachers, especially in disadvantaged areas, suffer abuse from their students. And I would say it's not just disadvantaged areas. In our day and age, in the society in which we live, I bet it's in all areas. High school and middle school teachers are suffering abuse from their students. Wikipedia defines a school as an institution designed to provide learning spaces and learning environments for the teaching of students under the direction of teachers. So being a school teacher must be one of the most thankless jobs that I can think of. 
And so while a teacher, I believe, envisions it's inspiring their students, much like we've seen in some popular movies like Robin Williams in The Dead Poet Society or Hilary Swank in Freedom Writers, that dream that they have of inspiring their students sometimes far exceeds the reality. In fact, I read about a professor named John Rogers, who's a professor at Plymouth State University. For several years before he became a professor at Plymouth State University, he taught at a high school in South Korea. And recalling those years in Korea, he writes this. He says, every weekday morning, for well over 200 days a year, the students arrived at the elite South Korean prep school where I taught English by 7.40 a.m. Teachers and supervisor students were waiting outside the entrance to check their hair for length, style, no perms or dyes were allowed, and their attire, uniform shirts tucked in, shirts at the knee, formal shoes. They were, then they climbed into their chairs to their homerooms where they um, mopped the floors, they scrubbed the desks, they wiped windows and cleared trash. Now this is not volunteer staff, this is the students that are doing this. The academic day would begin at 8. So they got there early, 20 minutes early, to go in, scrub the floors, clean the desks, and tidy up the room to get it ready for that day's academics. Pausing for 10-minute breaks, a 50-minute lunch, and an hour-long dinner at 5 p.m. At 6 p.m., when I usually shut down my computer, Professor Rogers says, the students would be settling into their seats for four more hours of self-study during which teachers would monitor them to make sure they did not surrender to sleep, chat, or do anything other than study. Aren't you glad that you're not a Korean? At 10.20 p.m., classes emptied. Liberated kids headed to waiting buses for their ride home because few lived nearby. Most students wouldn't see bed until after midnight. An old adage recommends four hours of sleep a night in order to enter a top university. That's what Korean students did. So when Professor Rogers arrived back in the United States, an older university professor asked him to give a lecture to a freshman philosophy class on his years of teaching in Asia. In contrast to his Korean experience, Professor Rogers noticed how bored American students appeared. Many of them secretly or openly played with digital devices during his lecture. The older professor told him that really he had delivered his lecture to the five or so students who expressed interest, asked questions, and who would go on to do great things. So out of the whole room full of students, you were really giving your lecture to about five. Those students who take themselves seriously are eager to learn and are the ones who benefit from the schooling in the long run. Now, isn't that sad? A sad epitaph of American education. But as with many areas of life, it's fair to say that you get from school what you put into it. You will get out of an education what you put into an education. So as we continue our study in the 119th Psalm, if you have your Bibles, I would encourage you to turn there. The section we are going to look at today takes us to school. Today we're going to be looking at verses 65 through 72. The word teach is found in verse 66 and 68. The word learn is found in verse 71. But this school is not set up like any other traditional classroom with desks and chairs. The psalmist here is writing about a different school. A school which I believe all of us will attend. It's the school of affliction. So just as a way of reminding us, this psalm was written, Psalm 119, as an acrostic poem. It's the longest chapter in the entire Bible, 176 verses divided into 22 stanzas of eight verses each. And each stanza starts with a word, the word of each line of those eight verses start with the letter of a corresponding letter of the Hebrew alphabet. We've looked at eight of those stanzas so far in our study through this psalm, and we're today in the ninth stanza, the stanza represented by the letter tet, which would correspond to the English letter T in our language. 
But I want you also to remember that this entire psalm that I believe David has written is about the importance of God's word in our daily lives. So if you would stand with me as we've been doing, as we've been going through this, uh, we're going to begin at verse 65 and read together through verse 72. Uh, words will be on the screen if you'd like to read from there. And let's begin at verse 65 where the psalmist says, You have dealt well with your servant, O Lord, according to your word. Teach me good judgment and knowledge, for I believe your commandments. Before I was afflicted, I went astray, but now I keep your word. You are good and do good. Teach me your statutes. The proud have forged a lie against me, but I will keep your precepts with my whole heart. Their heart is as fat as grease, but I delight in your law. It is good for me that I have been afflicted, that I may learn your statutes. The law of your mouth is better to me than thousands of coins of gold and silver. Thanks. You may be seated. We already mentioned how each verse starts with the letter uh, Tet here in this section. As I said, basically that's the letter T in the English language. But also of interest in this passage is that almost every verse begins with the same word. Five out of the eight verses begin with the same word. And the Hebrew word is tab. It means good. Good. And in fact, when we read in verse 65 in English, it says, You have dealt well with your servant. In Hebrew, it would literally be this way. Good you have dealt with your servant. Verse 66 would say, good discernment, teach me. Verse 68, good you are and do. Verse 71, good for me that I was afflicted. And verse 72, good to me the law of your mouth. Five times, not just once, but five times that word good is repeated in this particular section of Psalm 119. So we have this incredible emphasis on good in these verses. The goodness of God and the good it is in our lives to be what we're talking about today, afflicted. Now that's not how many of us would actually approach affliction in our lives. We wouldn't think that it would be good at all. In fact, the title of my message is The School of Affliction, The Good Life. Most of us don't associate or acquaint the good life with affliction. We think the good life is a life absence from affliction. We think that if I don't have troubles or trials or anything going wrong or bad in my life, then I'm living the good life. And in fact, we have conditioned ourselves to even talk about life being good. Think about the way that we greet one another. When you see somebody, you say, hi, how are you doing? And their automatic response is what? Good or great or I'm fine, how are you? And they would respond, I'm good, thank you. We tell each other that that's the goal is to have the good life. But David, I believe, is going to tell us here that the good life comes through affliction. So... I want to look at several things that we learn from this school of affliction and why it is so good to us and for us. And the first one, if you're taking notes in your outline, is this. The foundational truth upon which this school is based. Every school sets out to teach a certain discipline or a certain body of truth. Some schools are more specialized than others, but they all depend upon some specific tenets. Without those tenets, the school would have no purpose. And you probably feel like sometimes going to school is purposeless, right? There's no purpose in this. Why would I have to learn this subject? There's no purpose for this in my life. But every school approaches its tenets with a purpose in mind. So there's a foundation. And the school of affliction is no exception. It too has a foundational truth. And that foundational truth is found for us in verse 65. Verse 65, it says, You, God, deal well with your servants. Anytime affliction enters into our lives, we must grab hold of this truth that God deals well or good with his servants. If we fail to understand this, we may develop a bitterness towards God for allowing 
bad things to happen in our lives. We find this truth here in verse 65 that But we also understand that much affliction that we experience in this life is simply because we live in a world that is corrupted by sin. Death, suffering, pain, heartache were never a part of God's original intention for mankind. God's original creation did not include those things, and yet we live with those things in our lives. We live with death and pain and heartache And we want to escape it as often as we can and as much as we can. But they came as a result of man's disobedience and man's sin. Other afflictions can result from our ignorance, from specific sins that we commit, from a violation of life's principles. And for those things, we cannot blame God. That's our doing. In fact, in the book of Job, we're told that God allowed Satan to buffet Job with affliction. Just as God never told Job the reason behind his affliction, at least it's not recorded for us in the text of the book of Job, that Job ever understood why those things happened in his life. Just that they did. He never told him. And because of that, we also, I think, must recognize that some of our affliction, some of the things that happen in our lives may be a direct result of spiritual warfare. That we have no idea that is going on behind the scenes. We read the book of Job and we understand that God allowed Satan to do things to Job. And once again, Job never understood why. That there was a spiritual test going on. And sometimes maybe affliction that we go through in our lives is very similar to that. Spiritual warfare that God's allowing that we have no clue why it's happening. But in every case of affliction, we must come back to this foundational truth that God deals well with his servants. But secondly, we see that God's dealings with his servants is according to his word. All of God's dealings with our lives is according to his word. Nothing happens to you or nothing happens to me that cannot be explained apart from God's word. And there's no situation that we can ever have that we should not respond to according to God's word. It's tremendously comforting, I believe, to know that God is completely consistent in his dealings with me. That God is not up and down. That God's not moody. That God is not deciding, today's a good day, so I'm going to treat Wayne well. Oh, I'm having a bad day today. You better look out, Wayne. No, it's not like that at all. God is consistent in his dealings with me and he's consistent in his dealings with you. And we need to come back to this foundational truth that God deals well with his servants. So therefore, if I learn God's word, since it's according to his word, then I can anticipate the problems that I'm going to face. I can find my way through the maze of problems and afflictions that fills this life and I can discover what he wants me to do to conform to the image of my Savior. Therefore, the principles of God's word protect me. They protect me from bad attitudes. They reduce surprises and they show me the starting point to respond correctly to any trial that I may face in my life or any trial that you may face in your life. It starts with God's word. But secondly, the second thing I see here is the purposes of affliction in my life. Why does God allow his servants to be afflicted. You would think that God would want affliction to come upon those that weren't his children so that they would realize that they need God, and sometimes that's the case. But God also allows affliction in the life of his children. He allows us to hurt. He allows us to go through pain. He allows us to suffer. Why would God do that? Well, in verses 66 through 68, the psalmist identifies, I believe, two purposes of the affliction that he experienced. But before we get to those two purposes, I want to issue a word of caution. I think we must be careful in thinking that this side of heaven, we will always know or even recognize the purpose for our affliction. We want to know. We want to know why this is happening. In fact, sometimes we even cry out to God, why? Why am I suffering? Why is this continuing? Why aren't things different? Why isn't things any better in my life? We want to know the reason, but I'm telling you that we will not always know. And we may never know. Sometimes the purpose of affliction is revealed to us. Deuteronomy chapter 8 verse 3 says, 
So he humbled you and allowed you to hunger and fed you with manna which you did not know nor did your fathers know that he might make you to know that man shall not live by bread alone. But man lives by every word that proceeds from the mouth of the Lord. So sometimes God reveals to us why we go through certain afflictions in his word. And sometimes we may recognize that purpose as obvious. For example, when Joseph revealed himself to his brothers in Genesis chapter 45 and verse 5, he said, And now do not be distressed or angry with yourselves because you sold me here. For God sent me before you to preserve life. Joseph understood there was a bigger picture. And he, it was obvious to him that God was doing something extraordinary. That afflictions that he'd suffered in his life was because God was equipping him for a bigger purpose. So sometimes we recognize those afflictions as obvious. But there are times when we must be content to simply not know the purpose of our affliction. Job, as I said earlier, at least insofar as we know the text tells us, never learned the reason for his, his affliction. He simply learned to trust God in the midst. Romans chapter 8, verse 28 tells us that all things work together for good to those that love God and are called according to His purpose. But that purpose is to conform us, as Romans continues to say, into the image of our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. God may reveal a specific reason for the affliction. It may be obvious, or there may be times that we never know why we are being afflicted. But we must trust that God is producing Christ-likeness in us and through us for our good. Because God deals well with His servants. That foundational truth, right? But with that said, let's consider two purposes of affliction that the psalmist identifies. And the first one is this. Affliction is instructive. In both verses 68 and 66, the psalmist says, teach me. Teach me good judgment and knowledge and teach me your statutes. When God allows affliction in the lives of his children, he intends to teach them. Specifically, affliction taught the psalmist two things. It first taught him good judgment and knowledge because it taught him to believe in God's commands. When our affliction drives us to the scriptures as it should... We learn to trust God's word, which produces in us sound judgment and healthy knowledge. God wants us to learn and believe in him through what we're going through. He doesn't want to use it to drive us away, and yet it has that sometimes effect on us. Sometimes we let troubles and trials that come into our lives because we believe that we're never supposed to experience things like that to drive us away from God. Trouble comes, affliction comes, sometimes things happen that we don't understand and we go, well, if that's the way God's going to treat me, then I don't need God. So sad because God really wants it to drive us to his word so that we have a stronger relationship with him. But secondly, the psalmist says it taught him, even in the midst of affliction, that God is good. God is good. He learned this from God's word. He didn't learn this from his circumstances. God's Word taught him God's character. So when you are afflicted, what is your first response? Is it to complain? Is it to pray for deliverance? Perhaps we need to learn to ask God, what is He trying to teach us? What is He trying to do that's good in my life through whatever it is that I'm going through? But the second thing the psalmist here points out is that affliction is not just instructive, it's also corrective. Look at verse 67. 67, he says, Before I was afflicted, I went astray. But now, I keep your word. The word translated, went astray there, is used in other places in the Scriptures. In Leviticus chapter 5 and verse 18, in Numbers chapter 15 and verse 28, it's speaking about the sin that's committed in ignorance. It's also translated in Job 12, 16 as deceived. So the picture here seems to be that God uses affliction or God allows affliction to correct the psalmist, to prevent him from sinning unintentionally by relying upon his word. So affliction drove him to the, Lord, to the word where he learned God's truth, which corrected any previous sinful tendencies and also prevented him from falling into more sinful tendencies. So sometimes God afflicts us in order to correct us in order to prevent his people from falling into unintentional sin. In your affliction, 
We need to ask God, is God allowing this in order to correct a sinful tendency that I have or to prevent me from falling into further sin in my life? But the third thing we see here in this text is that there's a test, a test that's given to all the students. Exams are a necessary part of education. Wouldn't it be great if you went to school and didn't have to take tests? How many of you kids would like that? Well, we're almost getting there. (laughs) Outcome-based education, right? But exams are a necessary part to see what you are learning, to test you and whether you are grasping the knowledge. They're an indicator of what you've learned or not learned. So David describes his testing in verses 69 and 70 where he says, The proud have forged a lie against me, but I keep your precepts with my whole heart. Their heart is as fat as grease, but I delight in your law. See, part of David's homework in the school of affliction was to be a victim of forged lies. No one enjoys, I believe, being the target of people saying false things about them, especially those things that are against us by our attackers that are lies. Just not true at all. We don't enjoy that. And the proud don't just tell lies, they forge lies. They craft them, they shape them with special care. Job, as I've mentioned already several times, experienced the same kind of affliction. Three of his friends had come to comfort him in his time of trial. And when they saw the state that Job was in, they were speechless. And for seven days, they just sat down with Job in his afflicted condition and said nothing. But then when they did speak, (laughs) their speech was not comforting. Their speech was not encouraging. Their speech was not compassionate. They said, there must be a real reason why you are suffering so. All this vileness that's happened in your life is a direct result of your vile behavior, your sin against a holy God. So therefore, you must repent or you will never be unafflicted. That's the advice they gave him, much to his dismay, because he constantly kept saying, I am innocent before God of doing anything wrong. He protested loudly in his frustration. Listen to what he says in Job 13, verse 4. He tells his friends, you are forgers of lies. You are all worthless physicians. Can you imagine going to the doctor? Because you have something physically wrong with you. Maybe you've cut yourself or you've broken a limb or something. Or maybe it's just a, something inside that's upset. And you go to the doctor and the doctor says, sounds like you've got problems. Wow, that's a nasty gash. I bet that hurts. That looks horrible. Well, come back next week and see me. We'd say, what? I'm not paying you for that. You are a worthless physician. You've not helped me. And that's what Job says to his friends. Listen, you come here to offer me help and you're not helping. You're forging lies against me. But David here also describes his attackers as fat. Having fat hearts. Fat as grease. This image implies a heart that's not properly exercised. You know, we all know that physical exercise is beneficial to our physical bodies. And we all probably realize that we need to be doing more of that to keep our bodies in shape. But Paul tells Timothy that spiritual exercise is even more valuable in 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 8. Bodily exercise is profitable. It's good for you. But spiritual exercise unto godliness is far more valuable. We need to be careful that we don't neglect spiritual exercising of our hearts and let our hearts grow fat and lazy. Yet those negative attitudes that he expresses here is contrasted with the faithful heart and the positive attitudes in David's response. When he was confronted with the forged lies, he says, but I will keep God's precepts with my whole heart. You have fat hearts, but I'm going to keep God's word with my whole heart. When he described his enemies as having hearts fat as grease, he says, but I delight in your law. In neither case, notice, In neither case does David react with a a spirit of wanting to get even or revenge. He, He doesn't move in that way at all, but rather he is driven to God's word. When 
Affliction comes to him from outside by others. And listen, sometimes that happens in our lives. All of us would be able to tell instances where somebody else said something or did something to us that caused trouble in our lives, that troubled our spirit or troubled our heart or trouble physically in our lives. And we know that those people are responsible. And therefore, we want nothing to do with them or we want to get even with them. But that didn't happen with David. David was driven back to God's Word. Not to respond to his attackers. He chose to delight in God's truth. Which shows me that he's not ruled by his emotions. That's so not like us, isn't it? We experience a little bit of affliction and our emotions are all over the place. David is ruled by the Word of God. It's such a great lesson for us. When we are afflicted, do we scheme to get even? Do we seek to justify ourselves? Do we convince ourselves that our position is right and we're not going to back down from it? Or do we allow affliction to directly drive us back to God's Word? It really is all about our perspective. See, affliction is not our enemy. Affliction is our teacher. Afflictions are teacher. It's precisely the transition that I want to make to the next topic. Number four, the target of the curriculum. Just as in every school, its curriculum has a foundational truth, that curriculum has a target, a, a goal to reach or a change to make that would be a result of successfully completing the course of study. In verse 71, David identifies the target of the school of affliction where he says, it is good for me that I have been afflicted, that I may learn your statutes. While most people bemoan affliction, indulge in self-pity, and look for sympathy, David declares that it is good for him to be afflicted. I wonder if we can honestly say that. Can we honestly say that it is good when God allows affliction into our lives? David saw his suffering as an aid for him to learn God's Word when affliction drives us to the Lord, we learn to apply it. And when we allow affliction to produce bitterness and revenge and self-pity and other negative reactions, then affliction becomes the enemy. That becomes our focus. And like I've said many, many times, what we focus on is what we are drawn towards. When we allow affliction to drive us to God's Word, we learn who God is. And we learn that His Word is precious to us. Some people, I think, though, waste time trying to decide if affliction that's coming to them is coming from Satan or whether affliction is coming from God. And I say, what difference does it make? It doesn't matter whether it's coming because of Satan or it's coming because of God. If affliction drives us to the Word, the result will be the same no matter what. We'll never, I believe, be afflicted more than Job was. Who was responsible for Job's affliction? Well, we could say Satan was responsible. But God allowed it. God allowed Job to be afflicted. But Satan was the one that was doing the afflicting. And once again, Job had no idea that this was going on. So for Job to sit around and wonder, why was this happening? And how is it that this has come upon me? And yes, he asked those questions. But in the end, he realized he had a better understanding of who God was as a result of what he went through. So it didn't matter where it came from. We see this in several places. If we let affliction drive us to God's Word in order to learn from it and delight ourselves in it, there are other places in Scripture that shows us that we, that we can do that. In James chapter 1, verses 2-4, through four, it says, Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. And let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. Paul tells us in Romans chapter 5, verses 3 through 5, not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that the suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope, and hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who's been given to us. So how can we ever learn to forgive if we've never been hurt? How can we ever learn to trust God if we've not experienced a need to trust God? Affliction, I believe, is God's tool to teach us His Word. And once we understand that target, we can look at affliction as an ally 
rather than an enemy. We can say, like David said, it is good for me that I was afflicted, that I may learn your statutes. You know, in Genesis, back in the book of Genesis, when God created everything, every day he said it is good, it is good. And at the end he said it is very good. David is saying, listen, all that God has brought into my life, the good, even the not so good, the affliction, the troubles, it is good. It's all good. God looked at his creation and said, it's all very good. And David says, everything that God does is good. But there's a fifth thing I want us to see here, and that's the transformational thing that it happens to our value system, the transformation of our value system. You know, education shouldn't just train students in our intellect. It should also touch our character. When we're trained in the Word of God, the aim should be more than just filling our minds with information about the Bible. There should be a transformation of our value system, a change in our character. And this, this change came to David because of his affliction. In fact, he finishes this section in verse 72 by saying, The law of your mouth is better to me than thousands of coins of gold and silver. His conclusion was that there is nothing more precious in life than God's word. Now listen, David was a king. David was the king of the entire kingdom of Israel. He had wealth at his disposal. He had what many of us would consider the good life. And yet he said, no, that's not the good life. The good life is that I've been afflicted because it's taught me that God's word is more precious than all the gold and silver there ever is. The Apostle Paul understood this truth as well, and you and I will probably never be asked to endure what the Apostle Paul was asked to endure. Let me just read you what he says in 2 Corinthians chapter 11. You don't have to turn there, but 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 23 through 28, he says, They are ministers of Christ. I speak as a fool. I am more in labors more abundant, in stripes above measures, in prisons more frequently, in deaths often from the Jews. Five times I received 40 stripes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day I've been in the deep. In journeyings, often in perils of waters, in perils of robbers, in perils of my own countrymen, in perils of the Gentiles, in perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils among false brethren, in weariness and toil, in sleeplessness, often in hunger and thirst, in fastings, often in cold and nakedness. That's Paul talking about his ministry and the things that he suffered as a direct result of ministering. He says, besides the other things, what comes upon me daily, my deep concern for all the churches. I dare say none of us will have to suffer to the extent that Paul suffered. And yet, Paul learned what David learned. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 17 and 18, he says, for our light affliction. Those things I just read in 2 Corinthians chapter 11 didn't sound light to me. But that's what he called it. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory while we do not look at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporary, but the things which are not seen are eternal. It changed his perspective. And I dare say that if we allow affliction to drive us to God's word, it will do the same thing in our lives. It'll change our perspective to say, listen, the little affliction I go through was nothing like what Christ went through on the cross. Read Isaiah 53 again. He was afflicted for our good. Our affliction is light compared to his. And that light affliction, Paul says, is working a far greater thing in glory for us. It's nothing for us to go through a little affliction when we compare what Christ did for us, for our good. It's the realizing that there are some things that are temporary and there are some things that are eternal. Whatever affliction you may be going through in this life, even if it takes your life, is temporary. 
Eternity is forever. It's eternal. So I don't know what you may be going through today, right now in your life. I do know this, that we will all experience some sort of affliction in our lives. Our natural response to affliction is to run from it, to complain about it, to cry out, to have the tormenting of it to stop. Or we give up under the weight of the affliction. But hopefully today we've seen another response. That response that we can have through God and through His Word. The school of affliction is for our good. God designed it that way and He desires for us to learn from His Word and to grow as a result of our affliction. So remember the foundational truth that we started with. God deals well with His servants. He does this because he is good. And he does good. And he wants us to do what's good. And he wants the best for us. Let's pray. Father, once again, I thank you for the privilege and opportunity that you've given me to open your word, to look at this psalm. Psalm 119 that talks about the school of affliction. And God, to realize that every one of us at some point or time in our lives, and maybe many times in some of us for the entirety of our lives will go through affliction. God, help us to see that it's for our good, as David did. As David realized that it was the good of affliction that drove him back to your word. Help it to drive us there too, God, to learn and to grow, to realize that you are good and you do good in all of our lives. God, we'll be careful to thank you for all this we ask in Christ's name. Amen. Brother Dan. Thank you, Wayne. Parents, you're free to pick up your kids. Let's stand and sing our closing song. Strong in battle.
God is a strong tower, mighty and powerful, a place to go as a refuge. Trust in him.